Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this third of eight sessions for this 2024 series of the Grant Wood Country Forum. It's so nice to see everybody here and see repeat faces as well. Uh, we'd like to have you uh, join us tonight for uh, our featured presentation, which is Grant Wood's Connections meaning Marvin Cohn and Conger Metcalf with uh, historian and author Barbara Feller. That'll be exciting. But first, we'll do a couple little introductory things. Uh, first of all, we want to thank our um, online hosts, the Cedar Rapids Public Library. They've been with us the, uh, these last several years, and we couldn't do it without them. And we want to thank all the presenters of the series who are donating their time and expertise for the benefit of us being able to gather and do this every winter. Um, so thank you one and all for your contribution and thank you for, to those who come and observe or participate or get inspired uh, by what we're doing. Uh, we love to have you and be able to do this. Um, so without further ado, are you ready, Linda? <laughs> Tell us a little bit so. about this. Yeah. I think so. Um, hopefully, I have a new computer, so I hope the sound and everything is all right because the settings are all all new. Um, our, our first session, um, you referred to some of the J. Sigmund poems and the one um, called Belated Snowstorm had a very interesting rhyme pattern. And I thought, oh, I can do that. And I couldn't. <laughs> but in that same session, um, Joe had referred to um, the lithograph Wildflowers. And what happened was the rhyming pattern kind of evolved into its own thing, not Jay Sigmund's. And so what I have is a tribute. Wildflowers have quiet powers. Resting on the woodland floor or sketched in ink. Circle round with memories found. Feel the soft air. Recall the names. Trillium, spring beauty, spring peepers, jack in the pulpit. Pinks with creams shade my dreams, easing my soul, soothing my heart. Bravo. Thank you. Totally that was excellent. Yeah. And so, yep, that's what we do is we respond to what's been happening and and the art. And you did you you combined two a couple different things there. So that's great. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you. Um, let me see what's happening here. Got some people in the chat. Yep, yep. Check that chat, Linda. And so um thanks again. And the rest of you don't be shy. We'll just you know, if something hits you, we'll just share it. And uh, so this is your open invitation throughout the whole series. You can go back to something that we've heard, or if you get go down the rabbit hole, exploring something that came out of these sessions or Grant Wood in general, just feel free to be inspired and share. So we'd love to have that. So um, Paul Jewell, another author historian, has... Uh, has a uh, weekly factoids for us. What do you got, Paul? Well, I before we started the sessions this year, I, I thought it might be interesting to give out some facts that not everybody might know about Grant Wood. Um, I'm just going to kind of read them to you. Uh, if you know the answer, just file it away in your head. Um, and uh, hopefully I can confirm that you're right on it. Um, we both we all know that Grant Wood and and uh, Sarah. Um, we learned a lot about Sarah last week from Steve, and they honeymooned. Uh, they they actually got married in the Twin Cities, but they honeymooned uh, at an Iowa town, and that Iowa town was a hotel that was high above McGregor, Iowa. Um, so th that's a factoid. Um, I'm wondering if anybody might know Grant's nickname for his sister, Nan. And that nickname was Nikki, called her Nikki. 
And the family, the Wood family, had a nickname for Grant. Some called him the general, but most of the immediate family called him Gussie, G-U-S-S-I-E. Um, and the final one kind of ties in with last week when I talked about um, the Lenox uh, Collegiate Institute. Uh, Merville had also attended a boarding school in Anamosa before he went on uh, to Hopkinton, and that boarding school was called Hazel Knoll. And that's my factoids. <laughs> oh, those are awesome. Those are, in fact, factoids. You're not just going to pick those up just readily. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. And so now I'll have to figure out the name of that hotel. And in, in, uh, Mark, did you say McGregor? Yeah, I think it was the Heights. It was up above the town of okay. McGregor. Um, okay. There's a housing development that's way up on the hill. And I think there was a hotel up there that they stayed in. Well, I know the Heights area well. Um, yeah. it looks, I think there's a series of cabins up there now. Yeah. But but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there were a hotel up there. That, yeah. That'd be interesting. Okay. And so nicknames, say again, the nickname for that Grant would have for Nan was Nikki. Nikki. And the His family, family nickname was Gussie. Grant's was Gussie. And that was within the family? Yeah. Yeah, that was within the family. Okay. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Well, we've had our welcome. We've had our our welcome poem. We've had our factoid. It's now it's time for the news. All right. Um, in Grant Wood News this week. The Geography of the Imagination by Guy Davenport is being reissued this month. The 1981 book takes the name of the first essay in the book. There are 40 essays in it. The first essay contains a notable critique of American Gothic. So here are the cliff notes on this guy, Guy Davenport. He was a Rhodes Scholar who spoke five languages. He was a critic, an academic, a history junkie, an essayist, a painter, and a poet. But mostly, he was an observer and an idea dot connector. He was the kind of intellectual that nobody could fully keep up with. He wrote prolifically. Uh, he wrote books, articles, essays, and he corresponded with a lot of notable people. I think all of that material will be mined for years and years. The Geography of the Imagination was his Pies Du Resistance. The 40 essays cover a lot of ground while continually going back to art. You can read his ruminations on cave paintings, his reflections on Picasso's art, and his speculations about modernity and how artists reflect and resist it. I thought I would share with you some of my uh, favorite bits from this book. Uh, so I'll put up American Gothic so you can see it while you can hear what he wrote about it. She is product of the ages, this modest Iowa farm wife. She has the hairdo of a medieval Madonna, a Reformation collar, a Greek cameo, a 19th century pinafore. Martin Luther put her a step behind her husband. John Knox squared her shoulders. The stock market crash of 1929 put that look in her eyes. Curtains and aprons are as old as civilization itself, but their presence here in Iowa implies a cotton mill, a dye works, a roller press that prints calico, and a wholesale retail distribution system involving a post office, a train, its tracks, and in short, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Davenport's criticism is imaginative and poetic, as you just heard. It's rich in historical connections, and I think it's fascinating. Davenport died in 2005 with this new edition of the book, The Geography of the Imagination. Davenport's thoughts on American Gothic are likely to re-enter conversations about Grant Wood's life and art. The Akron Museum of Art in Ohio has a new exhibit that features an artist's interpolation of American Gothic. American Domestic is a 2016 digital pigment print and serigraph on paper by artist William Cole. The piece is on display as part of an exhibition called Retold, African American Art and Folklore. The exhibition runs through the end of March. And in market news, we showed you this two weeks ago, a December afternoon lithograph print. By, it was being sold at Leonard Auctions here in Chicago. 
the hammer fell Sunday and it sold for $2,200, which was just a bit above the high estimate for this particular print in its condition. An honorary degree lithograph hit the auction block at Bonham's Auctions, their Los Angeles branch. It sold for $1,200 on January 19th. And that's just a bit below the uh, low estimate for this particular print in its own condition. So there you have it. That's Grant Wood News for the week. Joe, what, what was the year that book was published you were showing us? 1981 was the first edition. Okay. I just know that they referred to American Gothic as the um, farmer and his wife. So it's interesting every time I see that, um, you know, because there's both out there in the know, we know that um, it's, it's supposed to be his daughter, but there are quotes from Grant Wood himself at times when he would say it was his wife or he would play dumb when someone else would say it. It's interesting how he kind of played along uh, and added to the confusion. Yeah, because he really liked to um, really hear what people, how they responded to it, how they reacted, right? He he almost felt that that was almost uh, more real than his interpretation, if that makes any sense. It reminds me of one of my favorite things about, you know, when you talk about artists and how people receive the art when they see the painting or hear the lyrics or whatever. There's this famous example about Sting, you know, from the band The Police, that famous song, Every Breath You Take. This beautiful song people have uh, played at their weddings. If you look at the lyrics and you listen to what Sting said about the song, it's a song about obsession. Every breath you take, I'll be watching you. But you know what? People take it a different way. And Sting was okay with that. And I think most artists, and Grant Wood especially, they like it when people see other things. And sometimes they'll kind of create art that kind of lends itself to a number of you know, interpretations, and they just like to see where it lands and they play along. <laughs> well, that's so, yep. Thank you for that. And, and it's, it's always fascinating too, to see when, when something gets auctioned off or sold, you know, that thanks for sharing that. Cause it, you know, we might not necessarily, you know, encounter that without going out and looking for it. And you, so that's, that's pretty cool. So, well, well, we'll get more next week, more factoids, more news, perhaps more poetry. So, and then of course, we'll have a, a featured presentation next week as well. But first we've got to have Barbara Feller and um, making Grant Woods connections. Love it. So onward, welcome, let's do this thing. Thank you, Elaine. This is going to be a couple of other surprises here. We'll see if it works. I will start out. Now, of course, it makes sense for those of you who know me that I would do Coe College as a connection because my husband has worked there for 45 years. So I thought I probably knew quite a lot about it, but to tell you the truth, when I did this, I learned some more and I'm going to share it with you. And I'm going to put on my reading glasses because I have notes and I don't want to miss out on seeing them. All right. Well, Coe College was founded in 1851 by Reverend Williston Jones, which I didn't know. I always thought it was founded by Daniel Coe. Um, it was founded by Reverend Jones as the School for Prophets while confessing for churches in the East to raise money for students to attend Eastern seminaries, Jones met the farmer, Daniel Coe, who donated $1,500 and encouraged Jones to open a college in Cedar Rapids. Coe's gift came with the stipulation that the college should offer education to both men and women. And when the Cedar Rapids campus opened in 1853 as the Cedar Rapids Collegiate Institute, it was co-educational. In 1875, the college was reestablished as co-college and in 1881, after a private donation from T. M. Sinclair, founder of the Sinclair Meatpacking Company, it was finally founded as co-college. Another school that's connected up to 
these people that we're about to talk about is Washington High School. It was built in 1855, the original high school in Cedar Rapids, not yet known by the name Washington. It opened in 1857. In 1869, it narrowed from a general school to a high school, originally called the Schoolhouse, or the Cedar Rapids Graded School. And the second ward school, it received its current name in 1875 when all the Cedar Rapids schools were named for presidents. Since it was the oldest building, it was called Washington High School. And it was here in 1906 when Grant Wood uh, entered the high school that he was introduced to Marvin Cohn. He was introduced to him by the district art supervisor, Emma Groton, who must have been quite the character, very well known in Cedar Rapids at the time. And one of the quotes I found about her was that she coaxed Cedar Rapids to turn towards something more cultural than a block of new pavement or a tall factory smokestack. Grant Wood and Marvin Cohn became fast friends right from the start. They worked on theater sets together at the high school, on yearbook and newspaper illustrations. And one fascinating thing that really influenced them is that across the street, this is on Green Square Park, and across on the other side of Green Square Park was a brand new library, the public library, with a, an art studio built on the top floor. And when these paintings would come in from all over, and they were pretty, they were pretty valuable, they wanted somebody to guard them, they hired, I'm not sure that they actually got money for it, but they had Grant Wood and Marvin Cohn watching over these paintings. So when a shipment would come in, one of the boys would actually sleep up there and the other would come on the way to school, throw pebbles on the windows of the library and wake him up, make sure he got to school on time. But while they were there unpacking those, that was what they both uh, credit with really getting them interested in, in real art. Now, Marvin Cohn is, as you know, or probably, you know, from the title, but at least you probably know this, was uh, known as Grant Wood's best friend. And he definitely has a co-connection above anybody else. Marvin Cohn um, and Grant Wood were both active in the Cedar Rapids Art Association one of the oldest art organizations in Iowa that eventually became the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. And one of the interesting things I learned is that there was a man by the name of E.M. Seaton in the 1890s, who was a music professor at Coe, who really, really wanted us to, uh, or I shouldn't say us, but wanted Coe to, uh, to get some culture. And he wanted our city, Cedar Rapids, to get culture. And because of him, um, we, we got Green's Opera House and we got the Museum of Art. So, and he's another co-connection. After graduating from Coe College, um, uh, Marvin Cohn had a liberal arts degree and he attended the Art Institute of Chicago. Then both he and Grant Wood joined the army during World War I. Because Marvin Cohn could speak French, he was selected to attend the University of Montpelier. And these are some uh, other connections I wanted you to see before we get on with Marvin Cohn. This is Grant Wood as a boy. This is a painting they did. They traveled to Paris. This is a Marvin Cohn painting. And here is the group um, at Stone City that you're going to hear a whole lot more about from Dorothy next week. This is a painting, part, this part of it is a painting called Corner of My Studio. And here's um, Winifred Cohn, Marvin Cohn's wife, holding uh, portraits of self-portraits. And my uh, screener, I don't know if you're seeing both of them. I wasn't seeing both of them. Okay. After graduating from Coe College with liberal arts degrees, Cohn attended the Art Institute of Chicago, as I said, and then he he had started studying after the war. He started studying in Montpellier in France. 
in February, February 19, 1919, before returning home, he was offered a job to teach French at Coe College. And, the, and he did, he accepted that. And the following summer, um, he and Wood returned to Paris. They went to London, Liverpool, and Antwerp, and both painted in the Impressionist style, held an exhibition of their artwork on the ship as they returned back to Cedar Rapids. And on that same trip home, Grant Wood introduced Marvin to Winifred Swift, whom Marvin married in 1921. Winifred and Marvin had one daughter, Doris, and I think an interesting thing for our group to learn is that uh, Doris eventually became a poet and wrote poetry about artists. I'll have one to share with you. During the 1920s, Cohn started the first art department at Coe College and kept an active schedule of exhibitions with the Cedar Rapids Art Association. At the time, Cedar Rapids was a thriving atmosphere for the arts. And in 1928, the American Federation of Arts and Carnegie Foundation provided $50,000 to open the little gallery with Ed Rowan hired as a trained museum administrator. Rowan arranged for Cohn and his wife to go back to Paris in 1929. In 1932, as I said, Marvin Cohn and Grant Wood taught at the Stone City Art Colony. And what I want to make mention of is the connection with Coe is that Coe uh, gave credit for courses there so that if you were going to that college, you could, you could get a credit for attending the art colony. Unfortunately, because of the depression, the art colony only lasted two years. After that, Cole, uh, Marvin Cohn continued. He was appointed professor of painting at Coe College, and Grant Wood went on to teach at the University of Iowa. Cohn never fit into the popular conception of regionalism. Throughout his life, he moved through a series of styles. He did landscapes, haunting interiors, clouds, circus scenes, and finally, abstract images. Unlike artists associated with regionalist and American scene paintings of the 1930s, Marvin Cohn would integrate his firsthand observations and move from realism to abstraction. Cohn remained, here are some of his haunting, really haunting pictures. And he always had this portrait of a man who we called Uncle Ben, who was apparently a an uncle of his who scared him. He very infrequently had real people in his paintings, though. Also, as a boy, he loved circuses and carnivals, so he has a whole series of paintings that he did with those in mind. But Beyond everything else, it was his family that was the most important. So here's a portrait of his wife, Winifred, done in 1928, and his daughter, Doris, reading a book. The painting was done in 1929. Cohn remained a co until his death on May 18, 1965. As a tribute to his 41 years of teaching at Coe College, they established the Marvin Cohn Collection and the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art maintains one of the largest collections of Marvin Cohn works in the United States. And when I learned that his daughter, Doris, became an author or wrote poems, I found this poem, which I wanted to share with you. And I believe that this is Albert Durier, he, she is referring to. Choosing a careful line, he used his hand to graft to northern flesh the southern mind. This done, he saw the self become divine, choosing his noble face painted his own. This with a piety of Saint Jerome, studying God and man in a sunlit room, where the skull is kind, the lion turned into cat, and fortune rides the world. And I, okay. The second person, which you knew that you would see, is Conger Metcalf. Conger Metcalf was uh, 
his grandfather came to America from Ireland. He was born in, Conger Metcalf was born in Cedar Rapids. His grandfather came from Ireland to design the grounds of Bruce Moore and also to design Green Square Park, that very park I mentioned that was between the um, library and the high school. Conger Metcalf also attended Washington High School. So now we have Grant Wood, we have Marvin Cohn, we have Conger Metcalf. They're not all there at the same time, but they all went to Washington High School. He studied art and in 1931, he entered a a painting to the Iowa Federation of Women's Clubs annual art contest, taking second prize in an oil painting just behind Marvin Cohn. And because of this, he was given a scholarship and he became the youngest person to attend Stone City Art Colony. Metcalf describes Grant Wood's insistence of tedious preparatory drawings that he claims were according to a system of tiny X shapes that reminded him of knitting a sweater. Metcalf made his first life drawings there, but they've been lost. We do have this one painting, Stone City, um, which is among some other landscapes that he painted in Wood's regionalist style. And um, I had an interview of his that I, that I'm taking a lot of quotes for. And it says the Stone City landscape has the plump form and toy village appeal of wood or cone, but also the thinly dis disguised boredom of a gifted pupil courteous enough to try to please his teacher. Actually, this painting of his, his brother Malcolm was the first painting that he did. And this is the one that won him that honor uh, the one that was just behind Marvin Cohn. And this is what he said about it in his interview. The portrait of my brother Malcolm was perhaps the first painting I ever did. I knew nothing about painting, just nothing. I think I was 16 and Malcolm was 14. Since I was five years old, I'd always gone to the piano. I wanted to be an accompanist. I didn't want to be a concert pianist. I just wanted to a company and that was my big dream. The only problem was I couldn't sight read, so I turned to painting and it's been a very satisfying, wonderful life. This is a man who sounds to me, I mean, look at that as a first painting. That's an incredible talent, I think. He moved to Boston when his brother uh, moved to Boston. His brother did have a singing career and he moved to Boston with him. And while there, um, Conger Metcalf was a student and later a teacher at the museum school at Tufts and stayed there until World War II came along. At that point, he was drafted first to North Africa and then to Italy. And he says, I'm so grateful to Uncle Sam for sending me to Italy. I found what I wanted to paint in Florence. What was that? Well, I'd begun to get a vision. I was especially fascinated by the poor in Florence and the children in particular moving against a lavish Renaissance background and their poverty. Children are everywhere in his work and everywhere they seem sad or at least pensive. Here are a couple pictures of some of the children. He also picked up the idea of having these very ornate frames. He also kind of stuck with this, pardon? Um, but I'm going back to this painting because besides using those same colors always, he, um, he said that he, he said children weren't his only subjects. Queenie uh, was a work based on his favorite model at the museum school, a stripper from Scully Square. And he said that she smoked two cartons of cigarettes a day, grabbed 10 cups of coffee, and then mentioned other activities that were in her life, but shouldn't probably be mentioned here. She was very warm, colorful, we say, colorful. The same could no doubt be said about him, though his canvases are not full of color. For years in Boston, he said he used no color, all sepias and brown tones, 
because he didn't want to use color as a crutch. He was interested in drawing. That was his great interest. And uh, this is an interesting drawing he did because he kept being told that he should do stuff that's related to Iowa. So he put two eggs on a sketch of Matisse and the eggs are from Iowa, according to him. This, uh, the drawing of the student, of the children, in addition, there's one on the left. That one is actually his mother. Okay. Well, as a little surprise, I thought, you know, we're interested in poetry, and this person certainly has a big connection to Coe College, and this is Paul Engel. Paul Engel was born in 1908 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He grew up the son of the li a livery stable owner, a background he never forgot. Engel grew up in the Wellington Heights section of Cedar Rapids. He also graduated from Washington High School in Cedar Rapids and later attended Coe College. He also attended the University of Iowa, Columbia University, and Merton College in Oxford, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar from 1933 to 1936. As a student at Iowa, Engel was one of the earliest recipients of an advanced degree awarded for creative work. His first collection, Worn Earth, which went on to win the Yale series of Younger Poets, his second book, American Song, was given a rave front page review in the New York Times book review section and was even briefly a bestseller. As a boy, Engel sold newspapers to the factory workers at Quaker Oats and followed his route to the city limits where he says coyotes howled at the moon. He also delivered newspapers to my favorite poet and one of yours, Jay Sigmund. And this is a quote he has about him. When I was a boy living at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 16th Street Southeast in Cedar Rapids, a quiet man, J.G. Sigmund, perhaps a little heavy with gentle voice and eyes as deep as Farmwell's lived across the street. As I grew up, Jay was there as a pre living presence of poetry for me. I began to write poetry, and when Jay discovered that curious fact, he loaned me books, the first modern poems I've ever read. They were an astonishment and a revelation. Every young kid wanting to write should be so lucky. Thanks to him, on that typical street of Midwestern wooden houses, I entered a new world and have never left it, nor will I until that door shuts finally. When he was a teenager, Engel left the newspaper business to become a soda jerk at a local Cedar Rapids drugstore. The a newspaper uh, brought him $7 a month, money that he put away for college. And um, then when he got, the, he got the job at the drugstore, he started realizing more and more about poetry. And the boss, who was proud of him, ordered magazines knowing that they would never sell but that he would read every page. There were transitions, that's the name of the magazine from Paris, where I first read James Joyce, he said. There was poetry magazine for verse from Chicago. Not one copy was ever sold, but in it I read T.S. Eliot, Carl Sandburg, Edgar Lee Masters, and Andrew Pound. In the fall of 1927, Paul Engel became a student at Coe College. He was the first person in his family to attend college. While at Cole, he developed a writing style that spoke of Iowa and its people. It was at Cole that the writing of this renowned man of letters started to develop. During the course of his studies at Cole, Engel participated in the Writers Club, at one time serving as its secretary. Paul Engel graduated magna cum laude in 1931 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English. His major honors thesis was Revelations of John Keats and Lee Hunt. The following year, he studied and wrote for a year at the University of Iowa and gained an MA degree. In 1932, his work started paying off. I won a very large fellowship to Columbia University, the Yale Series of Younger Poets Prize for publications of the first book, and a Rhodes Scholarship. Never was there such a miraculous year in my life up to then and never again. 
After completing his work as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, Engel was appointed the special lecturer in the School of Letters at the University of Iowa in 1937. That position allowed him to preside over roundtable discussions and lead seminars on writing at the workshop. It was at this time that Engel created and taught in the Writer's Workshop. In their book, Co. at 125, Jack Laugan and Florence Winkler noted that Engel was responsible for bringing some of the finest writers of the day to Iowa City, and that during his tenure, he raised millions of dollars in support of the program whose shape and direction proved the model for hundreds of writing programs that have followed. Engel became one of the first people to be awarded Co.'s highest honor, the Co. Founders Medal. Two years later, he was named the Honorary Poet Laureate of Iowa by resolution of the Iowa House of Representatives. The University of Iowa also honored him as one of 10 recipients of the Distinguished Alumni Achievement Awards. To further add to his notable accomplishments, in 1990, he received the award for Distinguished Service to the Arts from the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters. Paula Engel passed away in 1991. And um, from what I understand, it was at um, the, the airport. He was, he was at um, the airport in Chicago. I thought that um, you would like this quote, Elaine. This is dedicated to you and all the poets that are amongst us. Poetry is an ordinary language raised to the nth power. Poetry is boned with ideas, nerved and blooded with emotions, all held together by the delicate, tough skin of words. All right, here are some other books by Paul Engel. Now here's my last surprise. This is another person who I knew was connected to Coe, but I wasn't thinking about him at first. Um, this is William Shire. If you don't know his name, William Shire is known for writing the book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Shire's father was a Chicago lawyer. And when he was born in 1904, when he was, when he was a child, his father died and the family moved to Cedar Rapids. Shire attended, guess what? Washington High School and Coe College in Cedar Rapids. He graduated from Coe in 1925. He also had to deliver newspapers and sell eggs to help the family finances. After leaving school, he worked on the local newspaper, but ultimately was determined to leave Iowa. Working his way to Europe on a cattle boat to spend the summer there, he remained in Europe for 15 years. He was a European correspondent for the Chicago Tribune from 1925 to 1932. He covered Europe, the Near East, and India. In India, he formed a friendship with Mahatma Gandhi. Shire lived and worked in France for several years, starting in 1925. He left in the early 1930s, but returned frequently to Paris throughout the decade. He lived and worked as a correspondent in Nazi Germany from 1934 to 1940. Here are some of the books that he has written. Nightmare Years, This is Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, Berlin Diary, and one that is uh, Mid-Century Journey. I've read these. Um, and he also wrote some fiction all based on these years. Now you might ask how he's connected up as a friend to, um, to Grant Wood. Well, in the book, 20th Century Journey, there's a whole section on Grant Wood and his mother and because they were neighbors and he's talking about his, Shire was talking about his life in Cedar Rapids. And this is a quote that um, I've put into my next, my upcoming book. Um, when Shire was still in Paris, um, Grant Wood had gone to Paris and he'd had this, uh, he had had a display, he had had an ex exhibition at the Gallery Carmine, and um, he met up with William Shire for a, for a, in a cafe, um, to, just to talk and see his, his old neighbor, but Shire wrote this about him. He was depressed and in some kind of a revolt, I felt, against himself 
all these years wasted because I thought you couldn't get started as a painter unless you went to Paris and studied and painted like a Frenchman. I used to go back to Iowa and think how ugly it all was, nothing to paint. And all I could think of was getting back here so I could find something to paint, these pretty landscapes. Listen, Bill, I think at last I've learned something, at least about myself. Damn it, I think you've got to paint like you have to write what you know. And despite the years here and in other places, all I really know is Iowa. Now, it's going to come something that I'm going to stop the share for this part. And hopefully this is going to work. Hi, Isaac. I see you. Um, I'm going to share. This is a really big surprise for me. They actually made a movie about William Shire. It wasn't a movie. It was a miniseries, a TV miniseries, four parts. And if we're lucky, I'm going to get to uh, share the trailer with you. We'll see if this works or not. You seek the key, but you must first learn the discipline. First we have to have an Lesson one, energy is nothing without control. Lesson two, there is power in silence. Lesson three, unlock the energy within. Berlin, 1934. He came to find his story. Mr. Shirer, this area is strictly off limits. You must return immediately. Real life journalist William Shire. Facts exist. And I can report them. Had the one secret weapon that would stop Adolf Hitler. We are reporting the facts. You just don't like the truth when you read it. The truth. They won't let me talk. And they don't think Hitler's news either. But no one would listen. And the nightmare became real. Before in modern times, has man seen such horror? Co-written by the author of All the President's Men, Bob Woodward, and produced by former presidential advisor Gerald Rafshoe, The Nightmare Years depicts the dangerous manipulation of mass media during the Nazi regime. He risked his life to warn the outside world of the monstrous Nazi scheme. You are a foreign correspondent, and you are subject to military discipline, and I absolutely are right. right. Edward R. Murrow told the story, but it took Let William Shire to get the story. Stop that! Stop! Oscar nominee Sam Waterston, Martha Keller, The Nightmare Year. All right, now that was my problem. I have to figure out how to get back to it and get rid of the, get rid of this. The energy within. <laughs> okay, now we're getting rid of that. Sorry about that. That was my big fear for the night. Oh. So I wasn't even on. Could you hear hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. Did you get to see the movie? Did you all get to see? The yeah, movie? Oh, that okay. was remarkable, Barbara. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was a big surprise to me to realize that they had that 
All right, I'm going to share one last thing from you and then I'll stop and we'll and with you and then we'll stop and um, and we can talk. All right, this is going to show you um, what you what you can see at Co College when you want to go see the art there. Okay. They had the Winifred S. Cone Gallery, named in honor of the wife of the artist, where there are so many of the Cone paintings. There's the Gallery East, which also includes a bust made by Marvin Cone and something of interest to Dorothy here, Marvin Cone's uh, in the insignia he designed for the 34th Division of the United States Army. On the main floor on the east, there are uh, the last pieces of the Marvin Cone collection. And there are seven pieces by the noted pop artist, Andy Warhol on display. And in the main floor on the west, the North Study Room boasts 10 of a set of 15 photographs by Iowa City photographer, John W. Barry, featuring scenes from the Stone City Art Colony. In the Richter Room, there's another Marvin Cone piece depicting the quarry in Stone City. On the second floor in the Perrine Gallery um, are six large farm mules of murals of Grant Wood and uh, a smaller mural fruit basket and the fruits of Iowa commissioned by Eugene Epley for the coffee shop in his Cedar Rapids Montrose Hotel. There are also five uh, smaller pieces um, by Grant Wood, and um, they include the original drawing of um, Daughters of Revolution. In the Conger Metcalf Gallery at Cole, which is on the west on the second floor, they've acquired a collection of, Mo of Conger Metcalf's works. And in the, uh, on the east side, they have uh, a recent edition of Metcalf's remembering his mother, Medora. That was one of the pictures that I showed you in the original PowerPoint that I was sharing. There's also Sinclair Auditorium, which has changing art gallery pictures and McCabe Hall, which is the administrative building, but it includes a room that is a recreation of Condor Metcalf's Boston Art Studio. And now I think I will be able to talk with you. All right. That's it. Bravo. Thank you, Barbara, so much. You're welcome. That, there was a lot of extra, extra special touches there. <laughs> it was that film that really surprised me. And I had it originally that when I was doing the PowerPoint, I could uh, show it and just by clicking on it in there. But then I realized when I was trying to share it with my husband as a as a Zoom session that I couldn't do it that way. So, all right, uh, that's yeah. that's my presentation of these people who are connected up to Poe College. So impressive! Oh, we get we're getting lots of claps from across the across Thank the land, lost <laughs> across the landscape. Thank you. <laughs> One of the things I'll share that kind of will get us ready for next week, but Barbara connects to your wonderful, wonderful presentation, but just north of the Coe College campus is where, of course, Grant Wood and his mom and sister lived when they first came from Anamosa into the Cedar Rapids area. But that whole area just north of Coe College, it was his neighbors that helped him put together the Stone City Art Colony. So, you know, the dentist that was in American Gothic was just a block down the street there on First Avenue. The person who lent him the ice wagons was just through kind of the backyard and onto the next block. And then John W. Barry lived up on the hill um, north of where Grant lived, um, north of Coke College. So that whole area just north of there was just this wonderful neighborhood that Grant got to know but they were very instrumental in giving him a lot of the resources and things that he needed for the art colony. So yes. another co-connection. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And that house is, it's, it's marked and it's not going to be 
it's not going to be torn down. There was a, a worry for that, kind of like what we did a couple of weeks ago, you know, where they worried that they were going to take that land away because coal was building all around in that area, but they kept the house. And that's thanks to Mark Hunter and another se segment of our population. Um, in answer to your question, Marlis, um, you can find the video. It's a, it's a series. It's a four-part mini-series. You can find it on YouTube. It's not streaming anywhere, but you can see it on YouTube. And it's called The Nightmare Years. The Nightmare Years? And yes. it's just, and it's a four separate, it's four separate four, segments. Yeah, it's a four set mi mini series. On, and it's so remarkable to me, you know, that we had this person who was trying to warn us. And of course, you know, we're, we're being, we're in a world that has a lot of warnings coming out right now, and we don't know what's going to happen. But I know. I yeah. hesitate to say that to people I know. because it's so too shocking. But you know yeah. anything about Hitler yeah. and World War II? It's pretty scary. Yeah. It but is. It is. That's, so it looks like it's a beautiful um, documentary. I'm looking yeah. forward to seeing it. Thank you. Thank you. So much. You had me at Sam Waterston. That one did. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You got it right, Elaine. Yeah. <laughs> and Barbara, I thought it was a wonderful uh, presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. I might mention, too, that uh, during the last summer of Grant Wood's life that he spent at on Clare Lake, Iowa, uh, he was reading Shire's uh, book at that time, Berlin Diary. Oh. Yeah. Marvin Cohn also had uh, a studio in the uh, uh, carriage house behind the Averill house across okay. the road, across the street from Coe College. Mm -hmm. And there's a connection with Averill's to uh, our friend's sister who was, an, who was married to an Averill. His, oh. his wife was... Marvin Cohn's wife, sister, was married to an Averill, and he was in charge of the National Bank in Cedar Rapids. And his father, I think, was in the grocery business, and I think that was his father's house. So that's a kind of a backdoor connection. And they were both on the same alley to number five Turner Alley at one time. Yes, Grant Wood wanted that to become a whole, you know, an art <laughs> colony in itself. That it never it never quite happened. It is interesting how these people were all gathered together as neighbors and and interacting and everything. It's really an amazing, amazing thing. Thank you. Debbie's got her hand up. Yes. Her uh, Barbara, um, in your research, did you come across <laughs> uh, anything in regards to the first name Conger? Was that a family name? It's a name I've never heard before. You're right, and I don't, I don't know, but I, I definitely can check, check that out for you. Great, thank you, Debbie. What's well, up? I was just gonna make a comment, um, a cone connection. So both Dorothy and I have communicated with Marvin Cone's um, grandsons. Uh, uh, Stephen Cone Weeks and right. Peter Weeks. And Stephen Cone Weeks is an exceptional artist in his own right. And um, I believe he lives in Germany. Germany, and, yes. And um, anyway, but it was neat to see that you shared the poem, I guess, that, that would have been their mother. Um, what was her first name again, Barbara? Dorothy? Was it Dorothy? Doris. Doris. Okay. Doris. Yes. So, I want to learn a lot more about the family. I was in touch with them when I wrote my first book, The Road to Wabi. And actually, and I should have mentioned it, but that's the name of one of Marvin Cohn's paintings. And so I needed permission to use that as my title and as the cover. Um, you know, that was the cover picture. Um, and I have met them. 
but I really don't know a lot about them. And so I'm, I'm interested to do that. And this project has spurred me onward. I want to, I am also in touch with somebody who was uh, an assistant and good friend to Congo Metcalf who lives in Boston, but my daughter lives in Boston. So we're going to get together. Yeah. It's, it's they're, just like they're both, one big family, isn't it? Yeah. Everybody here. Yeah. They're both on Facebook and, um, I believe it was Stephen. I one. I don't know if it was Cooking in the Land of Corn or one of the the cookbooks. Um, and I believe there was one recipe I believe shared by Winifred, and um, so I shared it with him, and he says, "Oh boy, that brings back memories." Oh, I can't remember exactly what I'd have yeah, to look it yeah, up, but yeah, yeah, both very friendly, friendly gentlemen. And they live, they're Canadian, which I thought was interesting. Right, right. I saw that um, she was, I believe, in Canada when she wrote that, although I know they have the German connection. The poem was about a German artist, so I'm not sure where she was at the time. She wrote that poem in 1948. Thank you. Step. I always love hearing from you, <laughs> all these connections. I have some info on some Marvin Cohn paintings that sold in the past few months. Ah. Um, here are three that sold through Jackson's. Uh, Jackson's is in uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa. Uh, this is from 1929. It sold for $20,000 in November. Um, this sold for $50,000, the same auction, wow. a cloud painting. And you mentioned Uncle Ben and the stairs paintings. This one doesn't have Uncle Ben, but I, I love the, the stairs paintings. This one sold for $52,000 uh, oh, back in November. Yeah. Hmm. That's it. That seems pretty like like pretty good value to me. <laughs> his, uh, what are your his thoughts probably, about that? Yeah, the big barn ones come up every few years and they go for hundreds of thousands. And, um, Do they? Yeah, okay. there's one, uh, the owner of Aaron Gallery here in Chicago, he's got one, and uh, it's a, some of these are huge, and it's neat because the barn paintings are so well documented that you can, you know, with a little bit of research, you can see exactly where they were, and in some cases, they're still standing, but they had the names of the family and the barn names, and so um, those seem to to be of uh, particular interest to uh, collectors. Um, great presentation, Barbara, that was fantastic, I learned a lot. Thank you. The, I'm a member of the Marvin Cohn Art Club, and um, and <laughs> we are um, working on a project called um, that where we're going to try to put together a little movie or something about Marvin Cohn's life so that people will learn about it. And the people who are on the committee are are fabulous. They all have various connections, and I know it, it's going to be a two year project. And we have only met once, so. Um, but it's going to be great. Thank you. That'll Bye. be an absolute event, not miss event when that right. when right. that's uh, released. And, that's and they exciting. want it, yeah, and they want it to be able to be of interest for children learning about art as well as any age. But we have a lot of ideas. We'll just see see what happens. Thank you. So I guess I'll turn it back over to you or you're turning it back over to yourself there, Elaine. Are we done? Well, well, we this is this is that free flowing, far flung <laughs> moment. So right. anything that's on your mind, you want to anybody wants to piggyback on uh, what they've heard today um, or previously or circle back or. Feel, feel free to be as random as you want to be. So at this point, um, yep, we're three presentations in and we don't want to forget that uh, next week, Dorothy will be here, Dorothy Bunning Montgomery with Art Unveiled, the vibrant palette of the artists at Stone City Art Colony. So that's going to be really neat to hear from her on that and that's such a nice segue to have your two sessions back to back and there's sylvia's got some thoughts well i have a question first of all barb wow it was terrific um 
And I'm just wanting to check, was it Conger Metcalf's grandfather who came from Ireland yes. and was a landscape or garden right. specialist? Right. right. Do you have and then his, his father became a plumber. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. What were you going to ask me? Well, I was just going to ask if you had the grandfather's name or if, if um, that. I can certainly find that out. So we're going to find out the name of Conger, where that comes from, and the grandfather's name, right? So I'll have an assignment Bye. for next time. How's that? Because if he was the one who who designed the landscaping for Green Square, that was very significant. Oh, yes. Oh, at yes. The same time. So and, I'm curious yeah. about him. I, yeah. can, I can check in a second here. Well, or you could just tell us next time. I don't want you to have to. You guys chat amongst yourself and I'll see if I can find the answer. <laughs> oh, I don't mean you. You need to just relax, my dear. <laughs> oh, well, that's, yeah. that's all right. I'm, I'm going to relax now. I'll tell you that. There was, I a, have, was um, a very interesting uh, uh, interview of his. It was quite lengthy, so I couldn't use it, but. Uh, he he was quite the character, apparently very colorful in his language, and his descriptions of things. What were you saying? Linda? Oh, I have a question for Paul on one of oh. his factoids um, about the school and animals. So you said I thought I heard Hazel Knoll. Was yes, that correct? that's right, Linda. Do you know if there's any other information about that? There's a local cemetery also called Hazel Knoll. Well, Steve might know something. Is he still? Yeah. Steve, do you know anything about that? The school building itself is gone now. And I think somebody's built a house where the school was. But when I was a kid, this, the stone st school was still standing. But I don't know if there's a connection between that uh, Knoll Cemetery and that school at all. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It, yeah. it sure seems, uh, Li Linda, you know, I think we might both have relatives in that cemetery, Linda. Oh, definitely. Um, and it, it just seems like it's such a tiny place that there's got to be a connection somewhere, somehow. Maybe we'll stumble upon it. <laughs> Another rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and Deb, what what else you got on your mind? Well, of course, I, I always... Uh, when I think of something, then I have to go find it. So I found the comment that Stephen Cohn Weeks made about oh. his grandmother. So the recipe was uh, beef bechamel. I might be pronouncing it incorrectly, but this is what he said. And I thought, boy, he can really write well. He says, beef bechamel. I remember her cooking that. Thank you for sending. Winifred was a strong, and I don't know the pronunciation of this word, her sapacious and very determined woman. She flew over to attend my first opening here in Germany, 1981. She was 82. She fell down the stairs at my parents' house in Brussels. My father was stationed there at the time, broke several bones and had her cat, had her entire upper body in a cast. Oh, she man. still came to the opening and talked to people and enjoyed herself. So that was <laughs> when a friend Cohn that had the, the body cast on it. So I thought that was pretty cool. For That's sure. <laughs> wow. Well, I found that Conger's father's name is Cyrus, but it doesn't say, it just keeps saying how they came to uh, Iowa, but they don't say, they just call him their grandfather, the grandfather. So I'll keep looking. I'm sure I can find out. Well, I, I know I was scrambling to write down some, just like all these references to various books and things that came up. This was a very rich evening in terms of, you know, resources to explore, you know, if you're a bibliophile at all. So <laughs> speaking of that, Elaine, uh, Joe recommended a book to me that I sent away for, and I'm really enjoying reading it. 
And it's this book, um, which uh, talks about the Associated American artists, uh, mm -hmm. who were the people that marketed the lithographs that Grant created. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm really enjoying it. Thanks, Joe, for recommending that. And I, I'd recommend it to others of you, too. Or if you look, you can have mine after I read it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Paul was, uh, was the name of the school in Hop Kitten uh, not the Bowen Institute? Because um, I think that's what it was named initially. And, well, and when the, the Lennox, money, they well, changed it. Yeah, the Lennox one was originally the Bowen Institute, the one in Hopkinton. Right. And then uh, what I had in my notes was that from 1864 until 1884, it was called the Lennox Collegiate Institute. And okay. that that's probably right. Time. I just. Yeah, that would have been the time that Mervo would have been there, I think. But I have no idea how long he attended or or anything about about that experience for him. But it was highly unusual for a farm boy uh, to attend um, a, a college during that time. Well, I, I know something about it because I've researched the Bowens and that's how I know that. Mm -hmm. um, the Bowens were a large family and they were Quaker by background from New York and uh, two of the Bowens ended up in Iowa and the rest of them ended up in Chicago. And well before uh, the Chicago fire, they had a five story stone building in Chicago. So they were doing quite well for themselves. And that's how I know about the Bowens. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, Barbara, I sure wish I had asked my grandmother and my and her sister, my great aunt, more about life at Co. because they were there when Grant Wood was in Cedar Rapids. Oh. And yeah, that's a uh, and so I loved hearing about the history of the your uh, of the establishment of the college and and women because on that in that family all let's see i think all three of them my grandmother her sister and her brother all three went to co and then my mom's brother and my sister all went to co so yeah it's just it's just re but it's remarkable i would have loved it because she graduated in 1928 mm -hmm. wow. and, and so and then what stayed in the area and mm -hmm. so just would have known and i Wish I'd had the foresight to just talk to her more about it. Darn it. <laughs> there are a lot of, yeah, I've come across those kind of things too with my family. You wonder, yeah. Uh, yeah, Sylvia. I was just going to mention one thing about Williston Jones. Uh, Barb, did you probably, you probably already read that, but he was the first. I think he was the first minister at First Presbyterian there. Uh, and they just had, a year ago, they had their 175th. So he he was quite a progressive pastor, I, uh, my understanding is. So if you ever want to look up anything about him, they've got tons of material in their archives that about makes sense Williston Jones. Because Cole was a Presbyterian had a Presbyterian connection for sure. Yeah. Okay. Diane, what's what's on your mind? Well, I'm nosy. And so whenever we talk about genealogy and stuff like that, it looks like um, Conger Metcalf's father was Cyrus, but also his grandfather was Cyrus oh, okay. in Dublin, according to a, a family tree that I just looked at. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Another thing of just a little bit of interest, um, you know, I talked about uh, Merville going to Lenox College in Hopkinton. Well, there was a story that, then that circulated because uh, the the finances dropped off at, at Hopkinton. The, the town did not grow. And part of it was because there were three Presbyterian colleges within the area. Coe was one of them. 
Uh, Lenox uh, College was one of them, and the University of Dubuque were, was the other. And those two towns of Cedar Rapids and Dubuque grew rapidly. Hopkinton did not, and therefore the Presbyterians were giving more money to the other school, two schools, and Lenox College was kind of left out. That's a story I heard, and I found it to be of interest. It's kind of interesting because uh, the Scotch Presbyterians that came down from Canada that settled uh, from Scotch Grove also settled in, in and around Hopkitten. So between Hopkitten and Scotch Grove, there was this whole bunch of Canadians that had come from Scotland originally to work for uh, the trapping companies in Canada to provide food for those folks. And that never worked out well. And finally, they loaded up everything they had in, in wooden carts with wooden wheels with no metal in them and squeaked their way from uh, the Red River Valley all the way down to Scotch Grove, where they finally settled, or in Hopkitten. They kind of spread all out, out from Hopkitten all the way to Scotch Grove. And so that's where those Presbyterians are coming from. But if you look around today, the Scotch Grove Presbyterian Church now belongs to my brother-in-law. The Scotch Grove Presbyterian Church in Cascade and the Scotch Grove Presbyterian Church in Onslow are sharing a minister. The Scotch Grove Presbyterian Church in Center Junction is closed. The Presbyterian Church in Monticello is still alive, but barely, and I don't think they have a minister. So it's kind of gone away over time as the Scots just sort of disappeared and then that's where that, that got started because they had a lot of support here and that's just basically has gone away over time yeah well they're not that denomination isn't alone there's there's a lot of challenges for various denominations oh joe what's what'd you find what you got going on i was thinking about a couple of years ago the gilded pair the fantastic gallery right there on the uh, third avenue in, in cedar rapids or is it second um across from where the little art thing used to be anyway a few years ago they they had acquired a couple of new conger metcalf uh pieces in this brand new page of a Marvin Cohn sketch notebook and some Mauricio Lasansky stuff. So they had this wonderful reception. I was thinking back on that. I just searched online and they they do still have plenty of Conger Metcalf stuff. And uh, they still have the page from that Marvin Cohn sketchbook too. But um, yeah, shout out to the okay. Gilded Pair in Cedar Rapids. Um, okay. These Wait, artists- listening to a class. What? Legacy artists who have a connection to Grant Wood and, and Cedar Rapids, of course, um, are often represented in that cute little gallery that uh, has nice events and, and neat stuff. Um, pop by whenever you have a chance. Um, it's just always so cool to see them maintain that connection. Hmm. That is neat. Are there prices on the pieces, Joe? Yeah, I'll zoom in a little bit. These are ranging between 4,800. There's one for 9,500. Um, I know there was one that went for twice that at that event a couple of years ago. But yeah, it's interesting to see um, the prices and and just the overall style. You can see on this grid page here, there's a certain, you know, you could say that about the different styles that Cone painted, the different categories and there's a, almost a, a connective palette that Conger Metcalf seems to use. But yeah, if you search Gilded Pear, G-I-L-D-E-D, -E Pear, Cedar Rapids, you could find this website and, and search via artists and stuff. Um, pretty cool. That is cool, Joe. Thanks. <laughs> and Sylvia's waving goodbye. Nice to see you, Sylvia. And so, yeah, we're. I think we're 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 starting to really get good at these sessions, people. I think we <laughs> we're we're hitting uh, we're hitting we're making everything happen. We're having the conversations. It's just 
clicking right along. So certainly appreciate that. And, um, you know, just if there's just kind of, this is our, the last, the last chance to blurt out something, <laughs> or if you don't feel like blurting, you may gently speak. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> With uh, reference to um, American Gothic, I'm sure you're all aware of what our Iowa winter has been the last couple of weeks. Um, there was a, a, a new parody that showed only the Gothic window and the foreheads buried in snow this week. <laughs> I suppose that's not exactly uh, sh uh, surprising. <laughs> no. <laughs> another day, another parody, I swear. I, I don't know what the count is up to now, but I know it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of American Gothic, we'll have to check in with the folks down in Eldon and see where they're at on their some of their plans. We had them present last year. And I know they had some pretty major plans for what they were trying to expand and do down there. So do you have any updates on that, Steve, by chance? Uh, last I heard from her, she was on a cruise uh, down in the Caribbean. <laughs> well, I can't blame her for that. <laughs> no, I can't either. Um, the Intelligent Collector, it's a, a newsletter by the Heritage Auction House. They have articles and some neat research in there sometimes. They uh, Their last edition last week, uh, or was it this week? Anyway, they just had a piece on uh, famous art and the places that uh, they were depicted or were painted. And it, it featured American Gothic, of course, in the Eldon House right at the top of the article. It's always fun to see that uh, little you know, factoid of an interesting piece of history in Iowa get its, uh, you know, spotlight every now and then. Yeah, for sure. Well, it shows it's 7.55. Now, um, the gal at the... Uh, uh, library uh, indicated they're still working on the video from last week. We're not forgotten, but it's just not up and running yet. But um, yep, well, we'll continue to to um, try to uh, invite folks every week, you know, in various ways via social media. Don't be afraid to reach out and invite others, you know, if they think they're interested and would enjoy this sort of group. So. It's always a pleasure. I think it sounds like we have uh, we have done it again. <laughs> and thank you so much, Barbara, for everything, You're for welcome. all your hard work. And that was just fantastic. And thank you, Joe and Paul and and uh, Linda for the poem and you all for being here. We'll see you next week, hopefully. Right.